This is going to be linguistics at work. This is going to be your overview for a wide variety of careers in linguistics beyond academia. I'm Alex Johnston. I'm director of the Masters in Language and Communication program in the Department of Linguistics at Georgetown University. Before that, I worked in nonprofit organizations and as a solo entrepreneur and as a talent developer for corporate clients. And what we're going to do today, I'll let my co-presenter introduce herself in just a second, but I just want to let you know that what we're going to do is to provide you with a lot of information. Maybe it'll be overwhelming. Maybe there'll be a lot of new different, new and different position titles and, and different pathways and, and new things. However, this is just an overview. We are gonna connect the information we present today to sessions that you can attend throughout this entire month of events. So we'll be calling out different sessions that will expand different parts of this overview. So I think when you go if you go back to this presentation, you'll realize how it connects to events that you will be able to take part in later. And again, just a reminder to everyone who joins, please mute yourself. And I'll let my co-presenter, Emily Pace, introduce herself now. Thank you, Alex. Um, so, so glad to be here with, with you today and with, with all of our audience members. Um, I am currently the principal linguist at a company called Expert System USA that provides natural language processing products and solutions to federal government customers. Um, I have a, a master's degree in theoretical linguistics and I have been involved with the Linguistics Beyond Academia group as a co-convener for a couple of years now and um, before that was involved with the, the group um, in, a, in a more casual capacity. So I'm really happy to be here with, with all of you today and to see the interest that we've gotten in LCL. <laughs> And Alex, back over to you. Great, thank you, Emily. So let's go to our first slide. Let's get into this. All right, I think you've heard this before. When you say you're a linguist, what do people respond? Next slide, Emily. Something familiar to all of us. How many? How many languages do you speak? There you go. <laughs> yes, the same as that grumpy cat. How many languages do you speak? No, that is not what we do. And yet, that is so often the first uh, response when people learn that we're linguists. So next slide. What we're gonna be talking about is how linguists have a translation problem and nobody really knows what we do. We are different things to different people and we can provide different types of value to different types of employers. So here's just a, a smattering of what many people think linguists do next. Hmm. And we have to figure out based on our audience, how can we connect with that employer? How can we connect and let people know what we do, how we can provide value, how we can solve problems in the workplace? So we're gonna address some of that translation issue for you today and throughout the month of these events. So what we'll explore now and later is where will linguists actually work? And this is gonna be based on real data that we've collected, you'll hear about the data that we've collected on linguists in sectors outside of academia throughout business, nonprofit, tech, and beyond. And in addition to that, during our month of events, we are going to present a career management method for life. Yes, this is going to be something that you can take with you during this month and well beyond. So. And we're going to blow the lead right here. This is, this is the lead. And this is your method that we are going to expand upon throughout our career management tracks. Number one, when you, you need to discover yourself, your skills, your values, interests, and what you really like to do. And we're going to provide some tools for you to do that, to make explicit to you and to others what you 
are skilled in what you value and what you like to do. And then we're gonna try and find that fit. We'll give you steps, next steps to take to find that fit in the workplace. Next, step two, we are going to research where the jobs are. And through our career management track, we're gonna show you how to do that research. A lot of that involves talking with people, interacting with people, networking with people. We're gonna make that fun. And we're gonna show you the value of doing that. And then finally, we're gonna show you how to tailor your documents to specific jobs every single time. Tailor your documents, tailor your resume, and then apply to those jobs. That's what we cover. And that's something that is cyclical. You can repeat that throughout the course of your life whenever you find yourself in transition. So I know I'm presenting this as a really quick overview, but these are the basic steps that you can take as a linguist uh, or however you identify in order to find your next step in your career journey. So we're gonna give you that, that career management lens, which will change your outlook. Next, please. Um, it's not, there we go. Okay, <laughs> it got stuck. Um, so Alex mentioned that what we are going to be telling you about today was some actual data that, that we've collected. Um, back in the summer of, of 2019, so um, approximately an entire lifetime ago, we did uh, an initial career linguist survey um, run by the Linguistics Beyond Academia Special Interest Group and distributed uh, throughout some of our personal networks as well as our SIG Facebook page to try to get a sense of what were people with linguistics degrees doing. Um, and, you know, a couple of, of caveats about this survey. So we, this was our first time doing something like this. Um, so we, we had a, a good number of responses for our, our first, uh, first distribution um, over a, a pretty wide time range. So we even got some future career linguists into that, uh, that set of responses. And, um, you know, a, a couple of other notes about this. We, we did not necessarily circulate it as widely as we could have. We did not do extensive user testing with it. Um, so this is just a, a snapshot of one part of the career linguist community. So we will be highlighting a few things that we found as part of this survey, but we hope you will see this as a starting point for what linguists can do with their degrees, not an exhaustive list of what linguists have to do with their degrees. Um, and, you know, a, a, a range of, of people who have linguistics degrees at various levels, as well as non-linguistics degrees. We do have this survey data publicly available for anybody who's interested in checking it out. Um, I will post, I don't have the link handy right now, uh, but I can share that link in Slack later. And by the way, if you haven't joined us on Slack yet, you totally should. There's going to be a lot of great discussion and resources that will be shared there. Um, and, and so what I want to do is focus on, um, sorry, I'm trying to move to the next slide and it's stuck. There we go. On some of the places that you'll find linguists and specifically looking at some of the first job titles that we collected in this specific survey, which again was kind of a limited set. Um, and you can see there's a lot of different titles here, but what I want to focus on are, are some of the variation that you might see when you're looking for job titles. And again, don't worry too much about everything that's on, you know, this slide will be retouching on these themes throughout LCL. We will make these slides publicly available as well. So you can see that if you just look for something like communications or linguist or speech, that is a small subset of the job titles that people have as their first job after getting their linguistics degree. Um, and and what, you, you know, what you can take away from this are other job titles to look for and the range of, of jobs that people can do with their linguistics degrees, some of which will clearly be related to linguistics based on the job title. So something like, you know, an NLP engineer or, 
or cross-cultural communications. Uh, but we find a lot of linguists who are employed in broad sectors, even going beyond what some might consider to be in linguist, you know, in linguistics. Um, that's not a viewpoint that we take. We see linguistics training as incredibly valuable and incredibly applicable to so many different sectors. Um, so even even these positions that might not seem on face to be related. And Emily, if I could break in. Sure. When we look for keywords in job aggregators to look for announcements for positions in linguistics, we search for linguist. Linguist means different things to different people. So if you're searching for linguist in the government, in the federal government, that's going to mean somebody who is multilingual, somebody who speaks English and an additional language and uses that that knowledge in primarily in translation and, um, and other, other means. Linguist means something different in, in NLP companies and in other types of organizations and industry. So we're, we find across the job sectors that linguist is used with different shades of meaning. So you need to know how it's being used by a particular company and for a particular position. And we can also see that so many as these positions are so generic sounding, right? You see a lot of program coordinator, manager, project associate, associate coordinator, manager, all of those different levels of advancement within those tracks in a certain organization that don't tell you anything about what you're gonna do, right? So those are titles that you may not think apply to linguists and yet they will link up with a job announcement that will probably, it, or it potentially describe a project you might be coordinating that absolutely makes use of your skills as a linguist, perhaps as a sociolinguist, someone who understands how human interaction and conversation. So we're bringing this up now to let you know that you, you won't be finding jobs by keyword that will access all of the different types of positions that you may be very well suited for. This is again, something that we're gonna expand on in our career management track. As we talk about ways to find jobs within those big aggregators like Indeed and like Idealist, which is a job site for nonprofit organizations and higher ed organizations. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. And, and to add to what Alex said about the career management track, I also wanna highlight our career panel track because that is a great opportunity to hear from uh, different linguists who will have job titles different from these who work in specific industries and who will be a good resource for answering some of those questions about what does a linguist mean in your industry or your company, as well as you know, figuring out the space of, of job titles in that sector. So just to highlight that as a, another programming resource um, that will be coming your way. Um, I'm gonna just go quickly over these, these next two slides. This is just a snapshot again of this particular career survey that we did um, to, to show the, the variation in the level of degree that people have, but please don't walk away from this thinking that if you have a bachelor's degree in linguistics, you can't work in, in a nonprofit or for an NGO. That is not what this data means. Again, this was a very small subset of what people with linguistics degrees do. Um, and you can see the same type of thing when you look at current industries, um, a wide, wide variety of sectors that, that people take their linguistics degrees to. And that's actually what we're gonna unpack in the next section here to start with a little bit about the private sector. Yeah, and okay, so we have two columns here. On the left, we have areas where linguists can and do work. So I'm acquainted with linguists, some of whom have graduated from my program at Georgetown and some of whom are part of all of our personal networks who work in these areas. And then on the right, I just have a list of some job titles associated with these areas. And again, what you're going to see is that the titles, maybe they do include language, like language strategist or strategist and linguist, but other titles will have far, far different keywords associated with them. You may not think that a market researcher might include someone who has training in linguistics, but that can be the case. And you can find market researchers 
doing that type of work across different sectors. You can find them in for-profit and non-for-profit organizations. And just a reminder as we go through here, nonprofit organizations are, are a particular type of tax status. Uh, For-profit companies and organizations can definitely be mission-driven, can definitely have values that align with yours. So as we think about some of the roadblocks we might have about what organizations might be a good fit for us, we can think, let, let's try to keep open minds about different types of organizations and not close off to for-profit organizations. It just takes research to figure out if it's a good fit. Um, and if I could, could add one thing here, Alex, about some of these areas. Um, so what we have listed here uh, may look like these are totally distinct areas, but they might not be. So for instance, healthcare market research is going to be a smaller subsector of both healthcare and market research. So that's just something to keep in mind about all of these different areas that we're highlighting. These are not necessarily standalone industries. They can combine in, in different ways. And I wanna add one thing, if I may, I'll turn my video on so people can see who's talking. <clears throat> in these areas, this is really just a short list. And by the end of the four weeks, it'll be extending really long. Absolutely. This is just a small subset and you'll learn a lot more. Uh, so for fear, this is, this is not uh, restricted at all. Moving into other areas of the private sector, consulting, training and development, human resources, talent development and retention. In these areas, again, this is a small subset of some types of careers and titles that you'll find in the private sector. Um, this is a, so these areas can be associated with job titles such as corporate talent ma developer and manager, human resources specialist, diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist. In fact, tomorrow <laughs> when we have our first uh, career panel, you'll be hearing from one of these human resources specialists who is a DEI consultant, diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant who has created her own company. That is Sus Suzanne Wertheim, who will be presenting on the career panels, Linguists in Unexpected Places. So join us tomorrow for that panel. Um, just wanna draw your attention also, curriculum designer and instructional designer. Hey, there's me. This is what I used to do. I was in corporate talent development and that is from the website of the business that I worked with that provided professional development training to corporate clients in the agricultural, biotechnology and financial services space. So yeah, as a linguist, I worked in those spaces, training executives and managers in relationship management in intercultural perspectives, as you see here and in many other custom tailored curricula that I designed and delivered. And there are a number of private organizations that employ linguists, just putting that in quotes as a shorthand for what we, what we all know and love as uh, people in our linguistics community, but they're often called something else as we've noticed. So these companies listed right here, these organizations, some large, some small, very well-known names in here like Booz Allen Hamilton and MITRE, which are government contractors, Ogilvy, which is a healthcare organization, Comcast, yes, Comcast employs linguists. And you're gonna hear from representatives from some of these organizations. Every single one of these organizations employs several linguists that I personally know and who are known to us in our LCL organizing staff circle and who will soon be part of your professional circles. So again, please use this time with us to reach out to some of those linguists who we know uh, over LinkedIn and through messaging so that you can start to get to know linguists in those circles and expand your professional network because that is gonna be key to learning about what they actually do at Booz Allen Hamilton, at MITRE, at Comcast and figuring out wow, you know, what they do day to day, that sounds like what I know how to do from my training in academia. They're just using different words for it. 
And part of talking with people about what they do is learning those words. It's part of that translation issue. It's figuring out how to call what we do in academia, say, uh, playback analysis with a recorded sociolinguistic interview or a semi-structured interview, calling that focus grouping. So we're going to learn about those different words we can use in different sectors. Nonprofits. So again, nonprofits, non-exhausted list of ways that you can work with nonprofit organizations and what those job titles might be. So we have research translation and communication. Yeah, that's a thing. That's a way to be what we call a lingcomer, someone who engages in linguistic communication. If you were available in April and heard on social media about Gretchen McCulloch's first <laughs> ling, ling, lingcom conference, a conference for people who communicate about linguistics. Um, you would have heard about this type of area where people work. Yes, Lincom. That's what many people in academia make a living doing now is translating linguistic research to general audiences so that it's accessible to people who don't have the specialized jargon that we use within the field. That is a growing area. And we'll be hearing about people who work in that area later on in our program. We have many graduates from Georgetown University who work in these nonprofit organizations. So these are just a sample. These are just people that I know personally to let you know that yes, linguists can work as, as lingcomers, as uh, client facing uh, communicators who help other nonprofit organizations craft their brand messaging, craft their mission, and craft their messages to their stakeholders. For example, with Frameworks Institute. We have linguists who work in journalism. You'll be hearing from one of them later, Alexandra Boti, who has worked at NPR, at PRI, and who has a new job in podcasting, which is a growing area for linguists, as you as you well know, we'll be linking out to a number of podcasts and we're happy to have a podcaster here with us as well. And also the Center for Applied Linguistics is a way that you can find people who are turning a research into application to reach out and help people, immigrants, refugees, and people in K-12 education, people who teach languages. And we will be hearing from Francesca then uh, De Silvio later on from Cal in our applied research panel. So stay tuned for that. Next, turn over to Emily. Yeah, so I'm gonna pick up here to tell you a little bit about the public sector, which means the government uh, at the federal level, the state level and the local level that could be city or, or county level government as well. And, you know, when we talk about jobs outside of academia, we sometimes use the cover word of, of industry, which also can um, sometimes signal to people that we mean something like tech. But we're, we're, we're generally trying to use that, that term in a, in a broader way. Um, and one of the, the areas for employment for linguists that's in that, that alt act space and that presents a ton of opportunity, as much opportunity as exists in the private sector is the government. Um, so, you know, I know people who, for instance, have, might have very or re relatively similar job titles, job descriptions, things that they work on, um, skills and knowledge that they bring to the role, but one person works in the private sector and one person works in the public sector. So what we have listed here on, on this slide are just a few areas within the government uh, where, again, we know people who personally work. So on things like language assessment or training in the intelligence and defense space. But this is, again, by no means an exhaustive list of what people can do in, in the government. Um, I know somebody with a bachelor's degree in linguistics 
who works in uh, auditing for the for the who works for the federal government doing auditing, um, not necessarily something that you might think of as a career in linguistics, but she you know relies on her linguistics community her linguistics training to do communication in her job, and and so again you know a lot of people might think that it's it's sort of just you know just specific organizations in the government that hire linguists. And this is where it's worth underlining again that what in particular the federal government means when they say linguist is very different from what the private sector means or what we mean when we talk about linguist. So a linguist in a, in a federal context would be somebody who is a speaker of another language who has been tasked with something like um, translation or, or doing intelligence analysis in that specific language. Um, that can be a great job for a linguist if you are also a speaker of another language, um, but that does make it complicated if you're looking for jobs. You know, so US, USA Jobs, for anybody not familiar with it, is the uh, website for federal government employment. Thank you, Alex. You posted the link in Zoom. And um, when, when you are looking for jobs on that website, if you are looking for, you know, uh, not the federal government's meaning of linguist, you're going to be using some of those different job titles, because if you search for linguists, that's all you'll get. Um, and I, I see somebody's made a comment in the chat as well, that public sector mostly hires U.S. citizens. That is certainly correct. Um, and particularly for federal government agencies in the defense and intelligence space. Um, here we're talking about federal jobs that would only hire US citizens, but there will be different opportunities at the state level and the local level. So that's also part of what we, you know, what we're trying to get across with this message that government sounds like one big monolithic entity but it definitely is not in terms of the job opportunities are available uh, that are available. And we will be actually having a government specific session on I believe Thursday, July 22nd. We haven't quite finalized it yet, so it might not appear on the calendar, but we should be hearing there from someone who works for a, uh, a federal contractor, from someone who works directly for the federal government, and for someone who works for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, which for those of you outside the DC area, runs public transit in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and is a place where you might not have thought a linguist could have a role, um, but they certainly can. So I just want like to highlight. Can I highlight? Can I highlight three more uh, sessions? Yes, is this a please. Good time to do that. This is because okay, you do so have several I, sessions focused on government. So let's talk about that. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's a great uh, first entry point for many people. So you will hear from Ginny Reddish, R E D I S H. And uh, I think next week, middle of the week, Wednesday, she's going to talk about uh, writing for the web. And there are so many ways to take her book and her ideas and put them into use in all sectors. Ginny has a long experience in re relating to government agencies. Uh, second one is uh, that I'm aware of a woman named... Um, I'm, this, I'm losing her name. I can Sid, see her face. Sid, Sid Harrell. Sid Harrell, yeah. yes. C-Y-D is her first name. H-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. And she has written a short book, which she may make available to us as an e-book, about civic tech. And don't be turned off by the word tech, because when you're working in a tech environment, you have to call yourselves by the names that the people in that environment will recognize as authentic and authoritative. And so... Uh, I definitely recommend hearing what she has to say. And I think she's picked out a few skills that many of you have, but may not recognize as a hireable skill. And the third person I'm thinking of is Dana Chisnell, C-H-I-S-N-E-L-L. -L. She's just getting her uh, approvals to be able to talk to us. And this is her second time working for the US Digital Service, which is a federal agency that was started during the Obama administration. Um, and so Dana was there during that administration and has come back now with the new administration. And she calls herself a general problem solver. And she'll talk to us a bunch about one of the problems she's trying to solve now, having to do with 
what are the rules and regulations that the law demands that we do to provide for language access for speakers of other than English language, but also how do we provide accessibility for people um, who may not be literate in their first or second language. So lots of things to be interested in there and don't worry if they call it civic tech, it's also linguistics. So, um, and one more panel actually to highlight as a panel that Alex already mentioned, which is uh, the applied research panel. So that panel is going to feature one linguist who works at a, who does research at a nonprofit, one linguist who works in the public sector, and one linguist who works in the private sector. So that will be another panel to check out as well uh, for those of you who are interested in honestly any of the areas uh, that we've talked about here today. Uh, if you're interested in research. Um, and I just want to make one final comment here. We've I, I'm, I'm not going to, to read out this slide, but um, this is a, a an example of one thing that you can do if you're interested in finding your way into the federal government, um, particularly again into the intelligence and defense side, is to start off doing something uh, like contract rating or contract testing for the FBI. Um, this sort of contracting route, either through something like this or through working with for a, a defense contractor like MITRE or RAND or, or Booz Allen um, are ways to get started on that government path to get a security clearance and then to transfer or, or move directly into the public sector. Um, and I do wanna add one thing here about obtaining a clearance. Um, which is that if you are in a state where marijuana is legal, uh, you should know that it is not legal at the federal level and it is a uh, disqualifying uh, feature for getting a security clearance. Um, so just take note of that, things that are legal at the state level, but not legal at the federal level um, are problematic for obtaining a clearance if that is a route that you may want to go. Um, and we're getting, we're getting close to the end here. So I do want to go ahead and, and move on to talk about tech a little bit. And we have tech here in quotes because tech is enormous and varied. You can do technical work at an organization that is not explicitly a technical company. You can do non-technical work at organizations that are tech companies. So your big tech companies like Amazon, Apple, Google have people who work there who are not technical because they have a lot of things that need to get done. And we are certainly at this moment in time, uh, you know, at a place where most companies these days have to be tech companies to some degree, just because of how the, the world works. And so what we've listed here are a, a huge number of, of areas. And again, this is even just a limited list um, within, uh, within the broader tech sector of, of different types of work that people can do, some of which are technical in nature. So doing things like working on human language technology or natural language processing and understanding um, are probably going to require some technical skills, but there are other areas like user experience and localization and uh, ontology, sometimes also called taxonomy, sometimes called knowledge management, which is just all about sorting, sorting and organizing information. Um, so we we're going to have several sessions and I'll probably miss some of them, but I will mention a few specific ones and then Alex and Nancy can chime in as they remember others. So this Thursday, July 8th, um, we are going to have a session on human language technology jobs in industry. So that'll be a bit of an overview of what do, what do different titles mean and how technical are they? Um, we will have a session, a how-to on July 12th about working in human language technology, natural language processing and data science in terms of the types of technical skills that you need to do that. I do wanna stress that that is not a session to teach you those skills, but that is a session to identify what skills do you need to do what type of job in specific companies. Um, 
So that'll be a start for that. We are having an NLP panel that will be, so natural language processing panel that will be on July 22nd. Um, we will have a user experience panel that I think is on July 15th. Is that right, Nancy? I think so. Um, we will have, um, I think probably some other panels, but we have a lot. So we want to help me out if there's more to add to the list. Well, we'll be sending out those daily emails with these types of positions marked for you. And we'll also be inviting the linguists who present on these panels to join us in Mixer. So you'll have a chance to interact directly. And actually two more, one more panel to flag. We are doing an education technology panel as well, which is a subset of tech. And when Alex mentioned, you know, working in the private sector, but having a mission focus, ed tech is one place where you might find that um, because of course it is focused on, on education. Um, and then as Alex said, keep an eye out for the, uh, for the daily emails where we will be highlighting all of these different types of events. But the big takeaway here is that working in tech does not necessarily mean that you need to learn how to program. It is all gonna depend on what is the company that you're at, what are the different roles that they have and, and you know, what value can, can you bring there? And the answer is a lot, of course. Um, and here, just to highlight a, a few companies. Um, so of course you see some of the the, the big tech ones here, um, Amazon, Apple, Google. Um, we also know linguists who work at, at Salesforce, um, Expert System USA, that's my employer. I lead a team of what we call knowledge engineers. They are not, they are all linguists by training, but that's not the job title that we use for them um, because they work on problems of linguistics. They work on problems of natural language processing. They do not have training in computational linguistics, which is a whole other thing about tech that we'll talk about as we go through the program. Um, and, but they also do work in things like ontology and taxonomy development. So that's why we use this alternate job title. And I also wanna make a note here um, about Appen. So Appen is a, a, um, an employer that provides language data. So they hire a lot of contractors to do various types of work around language data, things like annotating that language data um, in order to provide it to other companies who need that for the products that they're building. And that can be a great way to, you know, get some industry experience on a relatively flexible schedule. But it's also important to note about contracting that it does not uh, it is not necessarily a path to a full-time job, either with the your employer as a contractor or the company that you are providing, ultimately providing services for. And this is really important in tech because a lot of tech companies rely on contractors to provide various types of information. And you are often limited in how you can present that work on your resume. So if you, for instance, are contracted by um, through ADECO to provide services to Google, you cannot list Google on your resume. You have to list ADECO by Google on your resume because ADECO is your actual employer. And so for more information about this, you know, the contracting and consulting space can be a, a great place, but it's important to understand what that means for you as a, as a worker. And we are having a panel about that. Um, I believe in the third week of the program, uh, we will have a, a, or maybe the second week, it'll be on the schedule, <laughs> um, but we are having a program specific to consulting and contracting where linguists who currently do that type of work will be able to talk about their experience and, and answer all of those sort of thorny questions about consulting and contracting. All right, so now what? Are you feeling overwhelmed? It's okay. If you are, good. It, it'll all start to make sense. This is kind of meant to be an overwhelming dump of information because I really have confidence that over the course of this month, some of the terms we've been using and some of the companies and organizations and people that we've been you know, name dropping here will become known to you. You'll at the end of the conference, I have a feeling that there will be people in these organizations that you will be connected with and that you'll have an idea of what they actually do. 
day to day. And maybe that you could do that thing too. And, you know, rest assured, we're covering all areas of linguistics. This is a really big tent program. So it's not going to be overly focused on one area of linguistics. We have organizations and people coming who represent the, the qualitative research methods that some of us are more familiar with. So yeah, like as an interactional <laughs> sociolinguist, I'll be pointing out those people and making sure that if you, you share that background in discourse analysis and in intercultural communication and interaction, I'll point out those people that you should connect with as well in those panels. So graphic here, research, develop, apply. We are going to be going through that throughout our career management sessions. And that's something that you'll be doing throughout your life, researching, developing your documents and applying for jobs. You'll be at different stages at different points in your life. So moving on to how we're gonna do that, we're going to talk throughout our career management sessions on how to turn your CV into a resume, turning your bullet points and your narratives into what we call star stories. We're going to flesh that out for you. We're going to assist you in making a LinkedIn profile. So if you don't have one, you can get that up, start connecting with people in this program and enlarging your professional network. That is going to be key to connecting with people outside of academia. This is a social professional platform that not many people in academia really use a lot, but outside of academia, it's gonna be your key to connecting with people, guaranteed. And we'll give you examples of how you can reach out to people on LinkedIn if you're not comfortable with doing that. We'll walk you through that process. As part of that, that's going to be part of your networking, part of enlarging your professional network. So we're going to talk about how to build and manage relationships with people who can link you to other people, other jobs, and other opportunities. That's going to be part of the work of this month. We're going to mention that it might be a good idea to think about creating a portfolio, an online digital portfolio that can showcase some of your projects. Yes, your academic projects, but presented in a way that are accessible to people outside of academia that are accessible to, to anyone, uh, especially employers who may ask to see a portfolio when you're going through the hiring process. Again, don't worry about this now, we will flesh out later. We're going to talk about how to research these job li lists and aggregators that we've thrown out today. What kind of keywords may be useful for you to use in your search? We're going to talk about how to target specific organizations, which you'll need to monitor uh, for their career pages and their social media. And we'll have a session on analyzing job announcements for the keywords that you should adopt. You should learn as if you're learning another variety of language in order to be able to connect with the hiring managers and employers who wrote that job announcement. We have to learn to speak their languages and their varieties in order to show them what we can do for them. And we're going to talk about how to tailoring your tailor your resume to apply to those jobs. So no worries, Emily. Next slide. You know, every organization needs a linguist. They just don't know it yet. And it's our job to tell them and show them what we can do. And, and convince them sometimes. <laughs> absolutely. And I just want to point out, this is one of my students who uses this quote, and I just latch onto it and use it all the time, because it is so true. And we have the data to prove that to you. And we have the method so that you can use it to show your value as a linguist and show how you can differentiate yourself, position yourself really well for jobs that fit you outside of academia, if you choose to follow that route. Again, we are agnostic about your choice of career. We just wanna give you the information that you might need, the tools you might need, should you choose to explore these careers outside of academia so you're well positioned as you take your next steps in your career journey. This is how you can connect with us. You know how to get in touch. Let's open up to any questions. And before we start answering questions, I, I also just want to reinforce what we've said, which is that you may have a question that occurs to you later about some of these. And as we indicated, there are going to be so many sessions that will be great places to continue to ask your questions. Uh, we have provided you with a bit 
a, a bit of a, of a teaser for a lot of the things we'll be talking about over the course of the month. Let's stop sharing, look at it, our audience. And if any of you feel like you want to unmute or you, Rachel, if you've seen some questions that have occurred in the chat that we can address, just, just feel free. And we really appreciate this audience here today. I believe in wait time. And while we're waiting for questions to arise, let me add, uh, build on what you said, Emily and Alex. And that is many times when you um, look at a job description, it may have 10 or 15 items listed that they want you to have. And I'm going to say to each of you, don't be too negative with yourself. If you only have five of those things, it might still be worth exploring that job because you probably have five or 10 others that they forgot to ask for because they don't know what a linguist can bring. So the, the fact that people are writing job descriptions for people other than linguists isn't our fault yet. But the fact that we're not responding to those job postings is our fault. Go ahead and brave it. Yes, Alex, don't be your own gatekeeper, exactly. Yes, and ah. thank you for that question about salary. You know what, we have a, we have a session for that. That's gonna be our answer for almost anything, I hope. <laughs> we have a session with Daniel Moglin coming later on. I think it's week three, rest assured, we'll let you know. It's gonna be about preparing for that first job interview. And there's gonna be a bit of mock interviewing there. There's, we're gonna go over different types of questions and help you know how you should structure your answers Hint, it has to do with these star stories. And we'll be talking about money. Let it, let's talk and be transparent about money because that we need to do that to let one another know uh, what we can ask for, what is out there and how we can research those salaries. So we're best positioned to negotiate when we go through that hiring process. So yes, we will talk money, absolutely. And there's gonna be a session about other kinds of compensation. So all of you who know professors know that professors get a salary and certain benefits if they're full-time people like healthcare and perhaps retirement account contributions and so on. But you don't get a signing bonus by being a faculty member and you don't get stock options. And there are a whole bunch of other kinds of compensation that you might want to ask for in private industry. And so you should know what you're, what we say, what money you're leaving on the table if you don't ask for those things. And so during the, I think the last full day of the meeting, the Thursday of the last week, the 29th is that, uh, we're gonna have somebody come in who has been an HR person, human resources person, and helped a lot of new graduates figure out what their compensation opportunities are. That's my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Leveraging all of Airbnb. our personal networks here to pull off linguistics career launch. Yes, and I want to draw your attention. Our program assistant, Rachel Lorch, is going to drop our link to the session evaluation in the chat. Send that to everybody, please, Rachel. And to let, get to another question, in the, oh, by the way, our short name of our program, which is what is asked for in our survey is, let's call opportunities. it. Opportunities. All right, opportunities. That's the short name that you'll enter in the session evaluation that Rachel is sending out to all of us right now. So we had a, we had a, a couple of other questions in the chat that I think we can, knockout. Um, how common is it for people to have a lot of the job attributes? The answer to that will depend a lot on the organization and the position. Um, you know, larger organizations that ha can draw from a bigger talent pool are likely to have applicants who, you know, do have a lot of those those job requirements. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't still apply because again, like Nancy said, 
you might be bringing something that they hadn't thought of that is valuable for them. Um, but for smaller companies, you know, where they have a smaller talent pool that they draw from, um, and I am a hiring manager at a smaller company, we sometimes get job applications from people who do not meet necessarily, have necessarily a lot of the requirements that doesn't disqualify them from the position. That's exactly what I would expect when I post a job. Um, so again, it can just vary a lot based on the company and the role and timing and many different things. And let's see, we have another question here about remote job opportunities. This is actually an interesting question. We do not have a specific session about remote opportunities, but this is a question that I would encourage you to ask throughout panels and over the course of the program, because there are, um, for instance, a lot of most consulting and, and contracting jobs are going to be remote. Um, uh, or certainly a lot of them will, you know, depending on what exactly they need. And then, of course, post-pandemic, um, a lot of companies are reevaluating their requirements for people to be in the office. Um, so this, this is a, a really good question about remote jobs. And again, will just depend on the company and is something I would encourage you to ask throughout the program. Yeah, and, you know, recognize, too, that we're still in flux as we are in various stages of this pandemic and different organizations are managing remote and in office work differently. So that is gonna be something to check in with different organizations about and to, to see how they're planning ahead and, and know that this is very much in flux. So um, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just gonna say, I saw, I saw one question cause we're getting to the end of our time and, and we should stop. Um, how do we find out who will be at office hours? Look in your launch manual. In the section about office hours, there is a link to the roster that is going to tell you who will be at office hours and you should continue to check that. We are updating both that and the Mixer roster as we go through the program. Um, and then we'll take this one last question that we have about info. Can I go ahead with this question? Yeah, I love that question. Okay, I was wondering, how, uh, will there be information on how we can compete with those who majored in the field we want to go into, e.g. marketing, course development, nonprofit? Alex, you were so excited to answer, tell us. I love this question. The, the, straight, the short answer is you can compete. In fact, your linguistics training gives you an edge in so many of these fields. Trust me and also look at the data. We will be <laughs> featuring linguists like Alexandra Boti, who not Bowtie for the transcription, um, who is working as a journalist based on her master's in language and communication, AKA sociolinguistics from Georgetown. And she will let you know straight up that her linguistics training was what set her apart and what has helped her throughout her career in journalism. The same with marketing. We have many linguists who work in marketing and linguistics training, knowledge of human interaction, how conversation works. That is something that differentiates them and gives them an edge in positioning self, themselves for that job. Rest assured, we're gonna cover that. You don't necessarily have to have that degree name to be able to work in those job, types of jobs. You just have to know how to talk about your skills and talk about what you can do for that employer, what problems you can solve and what you bring to them. So that's part of this, this you know, learning the language of the people you're interacting with in those organizations to tell them how you can be of value. So it's, we're gonna cover that and please keep bringing that question up. That's something you can always ask panelists and we'll, we'll find that will be a theme running for a month together. together. Mm -hmm.